Hi, my name is Miles Newman, and welcome to the Agora Online Staying Engaged session for Tuesday, 12th October, 2021. In this session, we're going to cover the background and the practice of being an umpire. From an experienced umpire, Greg Evers. It's under the title, So You Want to Be an Umpire. After that, we'll have our regular Q&A forum. Greg Evers is one of the new generation of Australian international officials. He has officiated at the IFAF Junior World Cup in 2018, the IFAF European Championships in 2019, and attended the IFAF Europe Officiating Clinic in 2020. He has participated in various AGL, Junior AGL, and mentored at the Women's AGL. He is also State Supervisor for New South Wales and on the AGOA board. So, let's get going. Let's welcome Greg Evers with So You Want to Be an Umpire. So we'll start off with, yeah, I was got a, a bit of a PowerPoint presentation based on a lot of the learning material that Miles and Paul have already put together. Um, and then I've also, um, at the end, if, depending on time, we've got some uh, footage of one of our playoff games last year um, where there's some interesting things from an umpire um, perspective. Um, and we might have a talk about some of those things that we'll have a look as we go through. So as Miles mentioned, it's... Um, no, this series is so you want to be. Generally, what I find is most of the time the attitude is so you have to be an umpire. Um, it's like, uh, I guess, the umpire is more around um, the perception of being an umpire is like, you know, you're like your Macs or your Windows. You either like really enjoy being an umpire or you despise it immensely and want to do something else. Um, there's generally not much of a middle ground um, with the umpire position. Uh, personally, I thoroughly enjoyed it because I'm you're always constantly around the ball, constantly involved in the play. But obviously then that has its um, disadvantages, whereas you can get into a lot of um, just following your process and not actually being switched on for every play. You, know, you just go through the process of what you need to do. So um, one of the, the goals when you're working umpire is to ensure that you're actually not just doing the mechanics that you need to be, but also engaged and switched on for uh, every play. Uh, the material that we'll cover off on um, comes from the MOFO, section 10, all on umpire, and section 19, generally just on calling fouls and um, covering off on those. What we'll be covering, we'll be covering a look at how the umpire works with the referee uh, to achieve successful game management. Generally, they're the two... Um, most experienced officials on the field, between them both, they have a good uh, grasp of the management of, you know, the interior lines, the running backs, the quarterbacks, um, where most of the action generally occurs. We'll go over the integration of responsibility, tasks, positioning, play reaction, crew management, game management. Now, most of the material that we've got is all based on a crew of five. Fortunately, with an umpire, it generally doesn't change much between five, six, seven, eight um, crew. Um, even when a centre judge comes in, the majority of your mechanics and responsibilities stay the same. There are some tweaks um, with the centre judge, um, but for you know, the purposes of this session, um, we'll concentrate on a crew of five because that's generally what we all run at a you know at a club level. Uh, the roles and responsibilities of an umpire. The role is the umpire manages the interior line and they need to have a solid presence and be prepared to work with the players. Um, you know, there's a lot of communication between umpires and players, um, you know, separating after plays, you know, getting off piles, clearing out, getting the ball back in. You need to be comfortable being surrounded by the play. Obviously, being in the middle of the field, receivers like to run crossing routes, linebackers like to drop in or drop out of coverage. So you need to have, a, you know, to an extent, a sixth sense of what's happening around you, be able to anticipate what players may be doing so that you can ensure that you stay safe, they stay safe, and, you know, you avoid the, 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 the highlighting um, material that people like to uh, show when umpires get cleared up with, you know, running backs running into them or getting blocked. Um, and obviously you want to ensure the ball is ready promptly. Now the, the umpire's responsibility is to spot the ball, 
We want to make sure that we get it in promptly. Obviously, we don't want to rush, but we want to make sure we're under control. We get it in nice and uh, in a reasonable, quickly amount of time. The sooner we get it in, the sooner the play gets set, the sooner players can, you know, get on with playing the game as opposed to, you know, we take a long time. There's more chance of extracurricular activity, which is what we want to uh, avoid. There needs to be an expert in the rules application. You know, with the umpire spotting the ball, any penalty enforcements are marked off. So obviously you need to ensure that you're across the rules applications. You know, ultimately it's the referee who uh, provides a lot of assistance and guidance on, on the rules, but it also helps if you've got a good grasp of the rules so you know where you're going from and where you're going to. You, you need to be able to be an expert in managing the line of scrimmage. Now, obviously, with offensive line and defensive line being so close, constantly in contact, coming from all different angles, uh, you know, it is generally gets pretty heated in there as far as a, from an emotional perspective. So the better that you can manage the players in there, um, the easier it makes the game go. You need to be an expert in communications. You've got you know, communication with the referee, with your shallow wings for the line spots, communication with the players around you. Um, so, you know, you want to be a key with that. You also want to be key and uh, an expert in penalty enforcement. As I said earlier, just making sure that we're marking off the fouls in the correct positions. You know, it's easy to be facing the wrong direction, start marking a foul off and then have to go back and backtrack. It obviously doesn't look great. So we want to make sure that we're actually enforcing penalties, you know, the correctly the way they were supposed to be. Uh, enforcing them. Responsibilities, the off-field responsibility is ensuring that player equipment is legal. Now, in depending on the competition you're in, you might have 20 minutes, half an hour to go around to the teams and you, know, you obviously check to make sure the things like um, face masks are okay, mouth guards are, you know, the right, right suits have all got the you know, prescribed lowers and you know, all the, the equipment that they require. High level games or maybe playoff games, you might have a longer time to actually go through that and you can observe that during you know, the team's full warm up. But it's crucial that we ensure that all the equipment is legal, ideally before the game starts, provides less you know, stoppages through the game. And we want to attain the coach's certification. So prior to the start of the game, we go around with the referee, go meet the head coaches, have a you know, pre-game discussion with them and just make sure that they're across all the requirements so all their players are fully equipped correctly. You know, the players understand how to use their equipment and just to ensure that, um, you know, that the, the, we've communicated with the coaches. On the field, we observe the coin toss. So with the referee, we set out um, on the side opposite, you know, the, the press box. So we're... We're there as an observer just to um, you know, observe the, the coin toss winner. Obviously, if the referee or the captains get muddled with choices and things, we can provide some guidance, but generally it's just there to provide an extra um, view. So there's no dispute as to who won the coin toss and what the decisions were. Now, on the field, we want to keep the interior alignment focused. So we want to keep them concentrated on their tasks, um, on their plays, if there's anything um, untowards, we want to do a lot more, um, you know, proactive officiating. So we want to get in there, break up any, you know, off the ball incidents, any discussions that's going on between players, get them in the huddles, get them away from the ball and get them set. And we want to spot the ball. Now, before we spot the ball, we want to make sure that we do plenty of dead ball officiating and not just worry about where the ball is getting in. We want to make sure that the play is finished. We do our dead ball officiating, and then we go and worry about the ball and getting the ball spot. Because if we go and worry about the ball while players are still engaged with each other, you know, ultimately something's going to happen that we're going to miss um, because we're not we're not doing the, our you know our responsibilities. But once the dead ball once the dead ball officiating has been finished or the players have separated, we go and spot the ball. And we have five man crew. It might be a case of having to run out outside the numbers, go grab the ball, come in. You know, shallow wings might be able to relay it. Referee might even get involved at some times. But 
the main responsibility for an umpire is to go and, and spot the ball and work with your, your wings to ensure the ball gets spotted you know, accurately as best we can. We want to manage the kickoff. So with when we do the kickoff, we're the position that you know, counts off and make sure the kicking team is ready, the players are aligned in the right spot, they're not, you know, too, they're, not, they're not more than five yards back from the ball. We signal with the referee when we're ready, we work back into you know, position and allow the kickoff to go through. Um, because we are involved in the play a lot of the time, we are also, you know, responsible for keeping the crew focused. So as an umpire, you generally gen t tend to cover a lot of the field, you know, across wise, up and down, and you work with a lot of your, the rest of your crew around, you know, ball spotting, result of the plays, um, anything that, you know, they've seen. So it's a good opportunity to actually get communication around amongst the queue, amongst the crew, and to be able to keep your crew focused, you know, it doesn't take much to just quickly pop out towards a shallowing and just give them a quick, you know, a pep talk or, a, you know, make sure they're all fine and switched on um, before getting involved, you know, getting the ball in and getting ready to go. And obviously a crucial point of being an umpire is checking and enforcing penalties. We want to make sure that the penalties, you know, we check with the referee what was what the penalty was what it was called for, where it is, how it gets applied, how it gets marked off, and then obviously enforcing it from you know, the enforcement spot. Well, the umpire being responsible for spotting the ball is responsible for working with your wings to ensure that we go through the correct process for enforcing penalties. You know, we work with the, the linesman and the line judge or the enforcement spot, mark it off, spot the new ball, and then we can all you know check off with each other to make sure that it's been marked accordingly. And it was all all of that's from chapter 10 in the MoFo. Wrong way. So. so game management, the line of scrimmage is obviously crucial for an umpire. You know, we'll go through the sections later on that'll talk about um, what our actual responsibilities are, where we line up. You know, who we're looking for. A lot of the time, as an umpire, you're doing a lot of preventative officiating. You know, as I mentioned earlier, linemen especially going, you know, flat out against each other, contact all the time, does tend to get a bit heated in there. I want to keep talking to the players, keep them focused. Obviously, we don't want to coach them, but we want to just make sure they stay focused on their job and not, you know, not worried about taunting and talking to, to the opposition. Referee and umpire can exchange information a lot between plays. They might, you know, there might be a, a play that looks a bit funky and they might just talk to each other and go, did you see that? Yes, yeah, or that, it was okay. You know, just confirming on, you know, the responsibilities, what's happening, if there's anything that we need to talk to other players for. Um, if there's anything that needs to get relayed to the coach, the umpire can obviously talk to the referee and the, the referee can relay the appropriate information at an appropriate time to the coach. Um, you should work with the linemen between the plays. Obviously, once the play's finished, ball spotted, there's some opportunity there to just have a quick you know, word to the lineman if you need to about spacings, lineups, uh, and those sort of situations. And with all of our officiating, that doesn't really matter what position we're doing. We want to use warning words about potential legal acts instead of threats. We want to say that was close to, you know, keep an eye on, be aware of, as opposed to next time you do this, you know, we can fail you or... Don't do that because then we have to fail you. We want to give them the softer words and more of the warning words about you know, the potential legal acts that they have. You know, if there's clear holding on the back side of a sweep to the opposite side, you know, you can quickly you can have a word to the lineman and say, hey, you know, that was close to, to holding. If the point of attack's near you, you know, be aware that it, you know you can be impacting on the play. So we want to be using words that. Um, are softer and more of a guidance to the players. When the ball's behind or beyond the neutral zone, we want to ensure effective communication about whether a pass near the neutral zone is forward or backwards. Now, we're not responsible for signaling that. That's our shallow wings, but we want to ensure that we're communicating with them. You know, if there's a, you know, a pass that looks like it's close to being a forward pass, backward pass, caught beyond or behind the neutral zone for screen plays and you know, blocking downfield by alignment, so it's ensuring that we communicate with 
the wings and the referee around balls that are near the neutral zone and whether they're forward or backwards. And the umpire has responsibility for the action around and ahead of the ball carrier, um, you know, with the, depending on whether the run's going up the middle or out the side, uh, and then the line blocking. So all of the, the blocking within the, you know, the offensive and the defensive line. Timing responsibilities as an umpire. You know, the umpire is responsible for the charge team timeouts, you know, 60 second timeouts. Um, referee calls the signals to timeout. Umpire is responsible for then recording that in 60 second interval to then give the, you know, the warning to the referee, 60 seconds is up. He'll give another five seconds and then blow the play blocking so we can get the, you know, the teams underway. And obviously towards the end of that 60 seconds, we want to be talking to our shallow wings to get the teams, you know, on the, on the field ready to go. Uh, umpire is responsible for timing the interval between the quarters. You know, generally it's, it generally flows pretty well, nice and quickly. But by the time you do the, you know, the chains and you move all them, it gives you the nice sort of 60 seconds to get that in, to get that in. But we just want to make sure you know, the umpire is responsible for just keeping that timing at a reasonable, you know, interval and also the interval after a score. So we want to, you know, obviously get the ball in quick. The umpire being responsible for the next kickoff. We want to make sure he's in position, make sure both teams are in position so we can get the, you know, get the plays moving more. The pre and post snap checklist for an umpire, similar to most of the other positions to a degree, um, but obviously a majority of it is around the actual spotting of the ball. So with the pre snap, we want to move to the spot for the snap and place the ball. Stay standing over the ball, check the down and the distance, and then only once the referee is ready, whether he's have to signal the play in or whether he's out of position for whatever reason, once the referee's in position um, and, you know, as well, the, the, the team A substitution has been completed, we then move out back to our working spot. We count team A off and check with the referee and we watch for pre-snap signals. Post-snap, we observe the play and react, whether it's a run, a pass or a kick, whether it's up the middle, whether it's to the side, you know, where it's deep, shallow, and then we understand what the result of it is. So whether the word forward progress was finished up, whether it was inbounds, out of bounds, obviously that's where we work with the shallow wings to get the result of the play um, and ensure that we can get the ball in next. We keep officiating until all the action stops. Now that's not just the action with the ball, that's the action with the players around the ball on the field um, and making sure that any um, action between players you know, is legal. And, you know, if there's anything required, we can go and do some preventative officiating if it, you know, it looks like it needs it. We can check, we then then check whether a first down has been made. We get the ball. So as you can see, post snap, getting the ball is sort of towards the end of our responsibilities. You know, we want to officiate everything else first and then get the ball, move smartly, smartly to the position for the next down. And then we go back to the pre-snap. So we then check the down distance, put the ball down, move to the working spot when the referee, and we just cycle through that. And obviously in our competition, the play cycle is generally 40 seconds. Some teams will run quicker. Some teams will push it to the limit, but that's the, you know, the process that we go through as an umpire. So the kickoff duties for an umpire. So in a five man crew, we've got the referee and head linesman back on the goal line. Line judge, sorry. Head linesman and the back judge have got the restraining lines and we have the kicking team. So we put, they either put the ball down on the line, you, know, you put the ball down on the kicking team's line. Generally have a chat to the kicker. You know, I like to do it every, every play. Hey, make sure your players are within the five yards. Make sure you've got the right numbers on the field. Make, you know, just ensure, just keep talking to them every, every kickoff. You know, keep your blocks high. Blocks above the waist, none in the back, you know, those sort of things. Um, move back into position and signal. You want to stay between the kicker and the ball until the referee blows the play in. That prevents them from, you know, starting to play or starting to kick off without everybody being ready. So we stay between the kicker and the ball. 
signal with the referee that we're ready. He blows it in. We move out of the way. The kicker then goes ahead. We want to count team A and check off so we can check off with the, the back judge or the headlinesman, depending on which, uh, which teams we've got. We hand the ball to the kicker or place it in the middle of their restraining line. You know, if they're lined up on a on a hash and the kicker's over on the hash, you know, we're not going to just put it in the middle of the field away from him. We can walk over to the kicker and you know, give him the ball on, on the hash. Uh, as I mentioned, we want to brief the kicker. Hey, you know, kick your blocks up. And make sure you've got, you know, your minimum four on either side. Make sure you've got your full numbers. Uh, check the readiness for play, including that, you know, we've got the formations right. Indicate the readiness to the referee. And then once he's ready for play, we move out of the way. And on a, on a kickoff, we then follow down the middle of the field and we essentially have that middle third hash mark to hash mark responsibility for you know, our zone responsibilities. Looking for blocks below the waist, blocks in the back, blindside blocks, those sort of you know, holding calls. And, and then as the play develops, you know, we develop the, you know, the clean up to responsibilities. Normal scrimmage play, a key combination to manage the game is the game pace and intensity. So as an umpire, we're crucial to the pace of the game. If we can get the ball in spotted reasonable time, you know, we don't have to get it in and spotted within two seconds of the play finishing. But if we get it in spotted in a reasonable amount of time, it allows the players to then focus on the game and on their play instead of anything else. Um, you know, we're also right in the middle so we can get a, a good feel for the intensity of the game. If it needs, if you know, if it's getting too heated, if we need to do anything preventative officiating wise to try and calm some of the, you know, the emotions down, you know, then we do that. We do a lot of pre-snap checks, referees, you know, we count off with the referee to make sure team A's got the right numbers, first downs, penalty process assessment and enforcement, working with our wings with penalty enforcements to ensure that we get the right marks. We want to manage across the whole field. You know, with a five-man, six, even up to a seven-man crew, without a centre judge, you've got a lot of responsibility in that middle of the field and you've got a lot of area to gallop cover. There's a lot of player communications and team communications um, between the umpire and the players and you know, to the referee as well. One of the keys with umpire positioning is generally when you're around the 15 yard line, you know, an umpire generally lines up about eight to nine yards from the line of scrimmage. When you get to around the team B's 10, 15 yard line, you know, or, or less, you can squeeze it up a little bit. Um, you don't want to squeeze it up too much. But one of the key things is you want to be aware of the goal line and you don't want to be over the goal line, right, right on the goal line, because that's where your, your wings are, will be looking at the responsibility of the runners and the passers passing them, you know, covering the goal line. So we want to stay off the goal line when we can, which is why when we get from the 15 and in, um, you know, generally probably the 15 to about the, the nine to eight, you want to stay in front of the goal line. Once you get to around about the eight or nine yard line, when you're lining up, just line up an extra yard uh, deep so you're off the goal line. It just allows clear vision for your wings to look across um, and it just keeps you, you know, out of the way um, for the players you know, as they get close to the goal line. Primary keys is an umpire. The umpire should focus initially on the snapper and then shift the three linemen at the point of attack. Now, just obviously focusing on the snapper allows you to pick up false starts by the interior line. You know that your wings will pick up the receivers and generally that, you know, they'll be able to see the, the tackles towards the outside and anyone in the backfield. You know, you'll be able to pick up the, the lineman in the middle around the snapper. You know, you'll be able to pick up the, you know, illegal snaps and, you know, false starts from the guards. Anyone else further out from the guards, you're, you're not likely to see just through, you know, physics of being able to look through people. You're responsible for the interior line. Um, you know, on run players, the offensive point of attack, generally looking in front of where the run is going, 
because the referee will be looking behind and the wings will be looking from the side. So with the back judge, you'll generally be picking up a lot of the, the action in front of the run, uh, wherever that's going to. Um, and on pass plays, the defensive point of attack. So when there's stunts and going on, um, keying off the defensive linemen to see where they're, the most pressure is likely to come through uh, and where, you know, an offensive lineman is likely to hold or, you know, where, you know, an illegal act is likely to happen. You want to look for ineligible players downfield on pass plays. Obviously, with a five-man crew, that becomes a little bit more difficult with your wings having so much responsibility on the receivers. Um, one of the keys that, as an umpire, it's good to pick up on is if you start at about the seven or eight yards deep, you see they can go into, into a passing uh, posture. You take about you know, two or three steps forward, you end up at about four or five yards. If an offensive lineman is past you when the ball is late, released, it's easy to for you know an illegal downfield. Um, if they're in front of you, as in closer to the line of scrimmage, you know, there's more chance that they're less than the, you know the three yards downfield that they're allowed. So um, on a pass play, um, as an umpire, you can generally step forward a couple of steps. Obviously, on a run play, stay still, stay safe, and and you know watch the play develop, uh, and look for engagement with defensive players. Now you've always, as as an umpire, you're going to have a lot of receivers running crossing routes, linebackers dropping in and out of coverage. So just be aware of um, the engagement of receivers as they come through, linemen on you know on angle blocks and pull blocks. Uh, just ensure that those blocks are legal. Play from scrimmage, you know, coverage, um, tackle to tackle box. Initially, for a middle run, we want to move laterally to get out of the way. You know, try and move as little as possible. The more that you stand still, the more your eyes can focus. The more you start moving around it, you know, it's harder physically for your eyes to stay focused. Um, so uh, the less you can move during a play, if it's close to you, the better. Now, obviously, once the play develops, you know, feel free to follow it. We want to cover the action at the point of attack and then around the ball carrier. You know, if it dives up the middle, especially, you'll notice guards and centers crashing in, crashing forward. You've got chances of, you know, Chop blocks, high lows, and those sort of things. So you want to keep an eye for those. Um, on long run plays, you want to cover the action between you and the ball. So let the ball, you know, players will come through. They'll get in front of you. You know you've got your back judge to cover around and in front of the run. You'll cover the action behind the run. You know, generally what will happen is somebody will be in chase mode, either offensive or defensive per player, and they'll push somebody in the back just to get it you know, through or out of the way. So we need to be aware of that. Uh, runs to a side zone. So when they're like a sweep or something to the side, we want to turn and move to the ball carrier and leave blockers, keep them in view. One of the balancing acts is you want to get, you want to stay a reasonable distance away. You don't want to get too close, but you don't want to be too far away. If you're too close, you don't be able to see the action as well. If you're too far away, you obviously uh, might be able to see some of it as well as well. So it becomes a fine balancing act between the distance between runs to the side, uh, but it's something that you become uh, comfortable with as you become um, more confident as being an umpire. With a pass play, as I mentioned earlier, you step forward to assist with the legal downfield on a pass. If you start at eight yards, take you know three or four steps, you'll know you'll be around the four yard by the time you stopped and then you can see what an offensive lineman's doing. Uh, when the ball is thrown, turn and observe the end of the pass. Um, you know, we, if you see an incomplete pass, obviously if you see the ball hit the ground, then signal it. But if you're not sure, trust your wings um, and they'll be able to pick up on that. Um, but obviously if you can turn around um, to give them that, that assistance. If there is some extracurricular uh, activity going on between the offensive linemen, I'll tend to stay focused on those. Just make sure they disengage. There's nothing untoward and then spin around and help uh, help the wings behind. Uh, and then obviously if there's a run after the catch, we treat it like the run. We want to pick up the action behind the behind the runner, knowing that the back judge and the wings will pick up around and uh, in front of the runner. One of the key responsibilities of an umpire is looking at the snapper on kick plays. 
Um, so when in a scrimmage kick formation, the snapper receives extra protection. So a defensive player can un- initiate contact until one second has elapsed after the snap. It, you know, it, by philosophy, it means until they can protect, protect themselves. So they've got to have enough time to snap the ball, finish their um, snapping motion, get their head up, and then you know, make a block to protect themselves. Shooting the gap and directly contacting the snapper is a foul. Um, however, if contact is incidental or occurs after a defensive player has been blocked by an adjacent offensive lineman, there is no foul. Now, the snapper is the primary responsibility umpire because the referee will be looking at, you know, the, either the punter or the holder and the kicker if it's a, you know, if it's a place kick. And obviously you've got your shallow wings on the side. So it's crucial that the umpire watches the action on the snapper and ensures that, you know, the snapper is protected. And, you know, with our preventative officiating mantra, you know, on every kick play, it's, you know, watch the snapper, give him a chance to get, you know, get him an opportunity to, to protect himself. So just touching on contact on the snapper, um, it, he's protected when it's obvious that a scrimmage kick will be made. So when a defender attempts to shoot the gap between the snapper and the adjacent lineman, if the initial contact is with the guard, then there's no foul. Um, if the contact is with the snapper directly, then it is a foul. And if it's a contact with both, then it's a foul as well. Obviously, we throw our flag and then we, we continue to officiate and let the play go. Um, so some summary thoughts on how we can help the crew. Ensure we get our pregame duties completed without being asked. Obviously, we can go through and we can observe and look at the the teams for equipment. We don't need the the referee or anybody else. We can go around and and observe and have a look at those. I want to coach and mentor the less experienced crew members. Obviously, with an umpire going to the, a lot of the times, you know, to the side or towards the side, play is ended. You can always have a quick word to your shallow wings. Deep passes when you're going back to get the ball off a back judge. You can have a quick word to him and obviously plenty of communications with the referee. So you've got plenty of opportunities as an umpire to talk and mentor your less experienced crew members and, you know, help them put a a great product together. You want to be a positive influence with the players. You have control of the most engaged players on the field. You know, there's five linemen generally from both sides or defense three or four. So you've already got eight to nine players all in that close vicinity that you have close contact with. You know, add in your linebackers that are generally around the line of scrimmage and you've got half of the players around you that you can proactively and provide a positive influence on during the, post, during the course of the game. And you get a chance to obviously stop the issues before they start. You know, players are getting heated. I mean, have a quick word, get the ball in, get the play moving on. And you know, gets the game flowing a little bit more. With fouls, we want to help the referee resolve what the fouls are. It might be a quick chat, quick chat, or the referee might just say a false start, defensive offside, and you know, we can move on. It might be a more complex one of a downfield defensive pass interference or you know, a chop block. Just in, you know, work with the referee to resolve what the what they are, where they're enforced from, what the enforcement is, and then march them off. And then try to check whether fouls exist before the referee gets there. So if, if there's a foul downfield near the back judge, you've got to go down there and get the ball anyway. You know, you can just make sure that what the back judge had clarify, make sure he's you know, clear with what he's got and let him go and report to the referee while you, you know, go and help relay the ball in or same with your, your wings. Um, with penalty enforcements, we want to ensure the enforcement obviously is correct. Make sure it gets marched from the right spot. You know, one of the things with an umpire is we want to make sure that not just the uh, the marching off of the penalty is correct, but we put it in the correct um, alignment. So position on the field, lateral alignment on the field. You know, is it on the hash mark? Is it in the middle of the field? Is it lined up with the goalposts? You know, we want to make sure that the lateral position of the ball is correct after an enforcement as well. And we want to confirm the down and direction with the linesman line judge before we march off any yardage. 
um, just to make sure that between the three of us, we all check off and we make sure that all the penalties you know, are enforced correctly are in the right spot. And I just want to thank Miles and Paul for the material part of the part of this that we're just going through. Uh, you know, that's the presentation. I'll I'll pull up a couple of uh, you know plays for a quick discussion. You know, just to highlight a couple of things around an umpire, um, and then you know feel free to you know ask questions as we go along. So just give me a, I'll uh, bring that up. So one of the things you you know here in GNSW, we use Huddle. Um, I actually quite like it because it actually allows us to just do a, a continual loop on a play while we have a discussion about it. So um, one of the things that was uh, quite interesting, and obviously there are other things happening on the plays, but for this intense purposes, we're just focusing on um, the umpire and some of the uh, interesting situations that umpires can get into. Um, so let's just start with this one and See what you all think. So obviously we are we're here in the middle of the field. Uh, you know, head up over the center, approximately eight yards deep. Um, and just as a word, maybe watch number three receiver from the closest to the camera. Um, as you can see, it um, becomes quite <laughs> challenging around being an umpire when you've got a ball going straight over your head and receivers running in. So trying to have a sixth sense of what's going on um, in an umpiring position can be uh, quite challenging. Um, but, you know, it does bring um, certainly some enjoyment around the field. So, so Greg and also Scott is sort of one of our more experienced umpires. In that situation, how, how can you better protect yourself and keep yourself safe? Well, you don't read it earlier than that guy did. Yeah. <laughs> Pick it up a lot earlier. That's you know, the first thing. He was standing there. He's asking to be picked off. You know, as, as I mentioned earlier, one of the things is when you read pass is we need to obviously step forward a couple of steps. So if we'd step forward a couple of steps on that, um, you know, even to – we'd be five or six yards off the ball, we'd be straight in front of – you know, we, we wouldn't be right where the players want to run. Um, the other thing is peripheral vision. Even though our responsibility is to, is being oh, to realign, you've got to know that there's the, there's the potential schedules out. for somebody yep. across in front of you. You've got to, um, you've got to be aware of it and step up or step back. And you've got Two to, straight home games. You've got to be looking oh, off to the side as well. The key is the peripheral vision. In that football, case. football, football. I mean, if you're not talking or asking a question, can you go on mute, please, so that the speaker doesn't get over-talked? I was going to ask who that was. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so just on that topic also, so that, that situation Brian Balsamo's posted the comment about, he's also starting nine yards deep. So what are you suggesting as an ideal depth for the umpire to start from? I generally try seven or eight. Um... You know, looking at the vision of this film that I was doing a little bit today, um, I changed a, changed a little bit between, drifted between seven and nine. Um, I generally try to care, generally stick to the seven or eight, um, especially in a, you know, a five bank where you can be a little bit closer to the to the line. Scott, what are you generally at? Are you seven to eight? He's in the window. I tend to cheat up a lot more simply because I'm confident in my ability to stay out of trouble. But um, I, even though they say between seven and nine yards, I hate that nine yards. You're asking for trouble if you line up there. You really, really are. It's much easier for me personally to back out than it is to step up. So I prefer to cheat up and then get out. But that's just me. Yeah. Hey, I, I generally, um, I find, uh, I generally try to count eight. I just generally, you know, I've been doing umpire quite a bit. I generally be comfortable at the eight um, and then step forward on a pass play. And then it, being about seven or eight also gives you a chance, to, if you need to move on a run play, to move before it gets to you. you know, if you squash up to the four to five, if a run coming up the middle, you don't get much chance to actually get out of the way. And a lot of it is down and distance. It's situation dependent as well. That's the other thing. And, and the I mean, other... Sorry, go for. Oh, sorry, Scott, I thought you finished. 
Um, so the other thing perhaps worth talking about, Greg, is the fact that you know, for those of us who have been around a bit longer, that the positioning used to be that the umpire would line up diagonally opposite the referee. So he'd take his cue from the referee's position, but we know that's no longer the mechanics. So the umpire's got to work out his own best position. And you, and you mentioned during your presentation about how on a running play, an umpire should move laterally if he moves at all. So, you know, uh, and explain why that is the way rather than sort of backing out. So, uh, on our, um, let me just see if I've got one here. Uh, not that I've got easily. So, with a, with a running play, uh, you know, if a, well, we'll use this one as an example. If the run comes up on the num towards the numbers on close to this close to the screen, um, just by just turning and facing the play, and you know, moving. If anything, if you have to, you can move laterally uh, back off a little bit. Um, it keeps your movement to a mere minimum and allows your eyes to focus on the the play in front. If you start moving too much and rushing around, your eyes actually just jump around in your head and make it a little bit hard to see. Um, but also with a running play, um, you generally let the play develop and pick up the action behind the run. You know, you've got your wings and your, you know, you're back on a five man, you, know, you get your back judge, obviously, you know, in, in this one, we were running a, a seven C. So we had a seven man crew with a center judge. We had no back judge, but we had our deep wings. Um, so you allow the deep wings, the shallow wings to pick up, you know, the, the, the action towards the sideline in front of the ball, and then you pick up. You still follow around your uh, your your offensive and your defensive linemen. Generally, they're the ones that are pursuing uh, behind the play. So, as you as you know, I don't know anything about being an umpire, but I'd always understood that if you read run, particularly if the run's coming up the middle, that the umpire would, as you say, slide laterally or even step up to let the runner go past them. Is is that something you would Sort of recommend because to me the understanding is that as an umpire you'd never back out if a running play is coming up the middle because the running play is still going to be coming at you. Exactly, so, and I had that exact same thing happen to me um, in a in a previous game where I got uh, I started backing out, and every time I took a step in one direction, the running back would go in the same direction, and we ended up sort of zigzagging for about two or three yards, and then I had a you know a defender run behind me and trip me up. Um, whereas if I'd stopped and taken a lateral movement or just pivoted and let the run flow in front of me, um, would have been safer. It, it's quite a common tra tactic of, uh, of running backs to, you know, especially if the umpire's sitting in a good spot for them, to actually try and target the umpire and try and get the umpire to move because the umpire's just created that gap they want. And it's, it's why, as, as, why as an umpire I always found that, you know, you're better off setting yourself up in a certain spot than maybe the next play you move a little bit so left or right. But you, you're constantly on the move. Moving in is better than moving back uh, was always something I found. Um, oh, and, uh, you know, admittedly, I haven't done it for a couple of years, but it, was, it, it hasn't changed in there. You can still see that it's the same basic problem. You've just got to get out of the way of the players. And that, that's an ex this, this is an example of, uh, yeah, where the, the umpire hasn't, is too static. You can even see just by the way they're standing, they're not they're not ready to move. A lot yeah. of it again is situation dependent, though. To be honest with you, mm. if you look now, the umpire hasn't looked around. Look where the free safety is. He's way off to the left. That umpire can back out all he wants if that run comes up the middle. It doesn't really matter. The important thing is is to get away from the action. If say mm. the defensive line all slant in and the linebackers crash in then back the hell out. Don't be there. But if everybody kind of spreads wide and you've got the room to step up, then you step up. The, but it's incumbent on the umpire to know six. if he's got the ability to go backwards. Because it's a six, there's no back judge back there. So there's nobody you're, you're going to crash with behind, uh, on your side you're going to crash with. Uh, no, but it, it's if the defence all kind of bunch in and the run comes up the middle... Because if, yeah, Marcus, if you step, if he steps up, you know, five yards and he's, you know, five or six yards off the off the ball, Two you've or got three. both linebackers. If there's a run up the middle, you're gonna have both linebackers crashing in right on top of you. So it's yeah. you know, it, I, I'm not talking about five or six. I'm just talking about yeah. Maybe I'd rather be moving forward. 
you know, maybe at a slow pace and moving backwards at that point. Yeah, in other words, it might be forward to the left, forward to the right to keep out of the way, but the point is moving rather rather than being static is is, is always something I've found better. But also it too, be, it's, but a, again, it's, it's a balancing depends. act between moving mm -hmm. and being still, because the stiller you are, the, eye, the more chance you have of your eyes working and being unfocused, you start moving around and just by the physicality, mm -hmm. your eyes start bouncing in your head and it makes it harder to pick up some of your, you know, the holdings and the, the hands and the arms in the, in the various spots. So it is a, a fine balancing act between stationary um, and, you know, reading the play and being out of the tour to officiate it effectively. Um, I do have a another one here. Let's see if I can. Let, let's do one more play, Greg. And this one, I think. No, this one. shows you know it's and there's um movement with purpose but it's not rushing forward you know it's stepping up you know you can easily see you know look around and see whether the offensive linemen are you are with you know if they were to shoot downfield you know if they get to where the umpire finishes um when the ball is released so if we were to stop it there you know the the umpire has taken a couple of steps forward. And as an umpire, you know that when that ball is released from the quarterback, if an offensive lineman is in front of you, then they are fine. They're not downfield. If they were to be equal with you or behind you, you know, you're three to four yards downfield. So they're clearly going to have, you know, downfield on a pass. Um, so which is why we want to walk with purpose, but we don't want to rush. We start running forward, everything just turns into a blur. If you start, you know, you walk with a purpose, you move with a purpose, you can still keep your focus and looking at your blocks while, um, you know, still helping out with downfield on a pass. And obviously, once the pass is completed or once the pass has gone over your head, turn around and assist with um, catches downfield. Now, with an, obviously, with a five man crew, it becomes a little more. Um, a little more on the umpire to help turn around with some play, completed passes. Obviously, once you get to the six, seven, or eight-man crew, you've got more help down there. Um, so, it, it, it's, again, it's a balancing act of do you watch any extracurricular stuff that's going on between the offensive linemen? Is there any, you know, holding or any, any face mask that could be going on that you need to keep an extra uh, look at? Or can you get your eyes downfield to help with, you know, a completed pass? And, you know, obviously the, the larger the crews and the deeper the pass, the less assistance you're going to provide. So you can keep in, you know, keep a look at the offensive lineman. Shorter, shallow passes in any direction, you might have a better view than some of the, the shallow wings. So. I think that's a pretty good example of quite a well-executed uh, action, actually. Because they're moving up, they're moving up quite nicely and smartly, as you say, and they're following the play around when it's gone past them. They should be able to see everything they need to see. Who is the umpire, by the way? That was me. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll just, I'm just going by the uh, the, the uh, towel. I didn't think you took that bigger towel. No, I didn't. But it um, it bucketed in that game. Okay. So it was, uh, yeah, it was more of a. So that was to keep you dry, not the ball. Yeah. Just keep my hands dry. But as everybody knows, when you're an umpire, if you get a little bit of a wet day, you end up with really pink red hands by the end of the game because the ball <laughs> tends to get um, – comes off on your fingers. Um, so, but yeah, uh, that's uh, – hmm? I was about okay. to say, any any last thoughts, Greg, before, before I wrap up on you? No, I just, I, you know, the last thought is umpire is a unique position and I generally find people either love it or they hate it. Um, you know, I played at tight end, so I was used to running around the middle of the field and stuff. And, you know, I love being involved in the game, which is why I love being an umpire. Obviously, lower man crew, you're spotting the ball all the time. You're constantly talking with players. Um I also enjoyed it at the start of my career because it kept me away from coaches. Didn't have to worry about sideline, didn't have to worry about coaches. Uh, you know, manage the players on the field. 
Uh, Scott might have a different reason as to why he enjoys it. Um, but, you know, umpires have their own reasons why they generally tend to it. And one thing I do find as an umpire is you tend to be the quieter of the officials as far as you, know, you get to evaluations and everyone's evaluating the deep wings and passes, the shallow wings for the progress spots. Umpires just sit in the middle and, you know, do their job quietly. So, um, yeah. You got any yeah. thoughts, Scott, about umpire? Being quiet on the – well, being one of the quieter ones, you clearly haven't spoken to any of my referees. <laughs> Yeah, I, I was going to say that, Scott. <laughs> I've got the loudest, fattest mouth on the field. And I'm uh, yeah, there's, there's, there's plenty of talk going on. Just as far as when you get to evaluations, you tend to be the forgotten official when they do you, you do game evaluations. Everyone goes, oh, you know, the shallow wings can work on this progress spot. The deep wings can work on these past completions. The umpire sort of just gets missed in the wash-up. So, um, yeah, that's it. Which no, can that's be good good. two steps up on what? <laughs> The other, the other thing about umpire is when you've got a video of the game, the umpire's in every bloody shot. But some people say that's because the umpires never do anything. <laughs> <laughs> and generally when there's photos of the game, it's usually the umpire is generally in a lot of the shots as well. Yeah. And usually usually not from a flattering position either. But Martin Miles, you can open it up for questions and things like that. Yeah, so, that's what I was just about to do. Beautiful. Do I have any general questions? Well, I've got a couple of things that perhaps you could expand on, Greg. So you talked first up about one of the roles of the umpire is to do the equipment check and, I, and equipment checks. And I think it's worth sort of highlighting the fact that that doesn't mean they have to go around and check everybody's equipment, but it's just the case of spot checks. And it doesn't sort of mean that the other officials shouldn't be doing that prior to the game as well and just doing any general observations but if they have any issues they should bring them to the umpire's attention because as you as you said it's the umpire who rules on the legality of equipment so if there's a question about some padding or a cast or gloves or things like that it should be directed to the umpire for him to make the determination on yeah exactly and you know, you'll work with your your wings as well as an umpire you'll if you see a player with potentially illegal equipment you know you could have a work chat to your shallow wing so they can talk to the coach and say, hey, you know, can you sort this player out? You know, um, it's an easier way of communicating with the rest of your crew and the sideline to ensure that players are, are fully equipped. And, you know, as we all know, pre-game, everyone wanders the field as, a, as an official and, you know, you generally observe what the players are, are wearing, what they're not wearing, what they should be wearing. Um, and so it, it, it is a crew responsibility, but ultimately it comes to the umpire for, you know, the I guess the final judgment on on the equipment. And you gave uh, you, you had a good slide there on and talked about protecting the snapper, and you talked about you know when the snapper is protected and then when he isn't. But it's probably also worth mentioning the fact that if the snapper stays down voluntarily, he doesn't get protection. He loses his protection because he's had the opportunity. As long as that one second has elapsed and he's had the opportunity to come up and he doesn't get protection just because he chooses to stay down. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, we, we all know that players like to uh, try to bend the rules to their advantage, and we know that snappers yeah. know that they get the advantage, and so they will we'll exaggerate their uh, snapping technique to get as much out of it as possible. And, you know, the rules are there designed to protect them but not to be, you know, exploited by them. You know, so if they stay down in their in their stance for you know two or three seconds, um, you know, then you know we as officials we can have a word to them and just say, hey, look, you realise that if you're down there that long, once you've been down there for you know a, a, the the second, um, they are entitled to to hit you if you're not going to come up and and try and protect yourself. Yeah, and I, and I think that's a good piece of preventative officiating to do that, communicating as you talked about with the players and letting them know you're seeing what's going on and you're aware of what's going on. And, and f finally, from me, and perhaps I'll throw this one to Scott. Scott, just do you want to just talk a little bit about, as an umpire, what you're going to do when, when you know that there's a foul on the field and as the referee's giving his preliminary signal, what are you doing during that period? And then how you and then perhaps demonstrate how you communicate with the wings about how the distance you're going to enforce on the penalty. For those who may not be able to cross it. 
Yeah, well, the thing is, if, if, if you want to be a decent umpire, you have to know your penalty enforcement. So I want to be part of... I don't need to make an input in the discussion when the foul is being reported, but I want to know what's going on. So that if, when the referee turns to me and tells me what the foul is, I can tell him what the enforcement is going to be. First, that's the first thing. The second thing is, when we march off our penalties, I want to make an initial signal to my wing. And it's a bit awkward because I'm not, but, but I'm just going to discreetly hold my hand out in front. And it's going to be five yards, 10 yards, 15 yards. And hopefully my wing will either give me the same signal or at least nod their head to acknowledge my response. But that's where we're going. And one of the, you know, one of the things that we need to be aware of as an umpire is where that penalty is enforced from. Um, obviously, whether it's a previous spot, spot of the foul, uh, wherever it's enforced from, we need to ensure that our wings not only know that it's a 5, 10, 15 yard penalty, but where it's getting enforced from so we can make sure we match it off accordingly. And, and the other, th from a referee's point of view, once we get a penalty to keep the game moving, while I'm out there giving my preliminary signals at the sideline or to the press box, I want my umpire to be getting out the offended team captain so that he's already there when I turn around after having given the preliminary signal. So we expedite that whole process. And hopefully if my umpire's up to speed on what's happening, my umpire's already explaining to him what his options are going to be. Look, you can decline it and take third and 10, or you can have second and 20. So. By the time I get there, the captain's already decided what he wants and I can just go out and give him a final signal and we can keep the game moving. And ideally, too, while your announcement is being made, the umpire is marching off the penalty. So by the time you finish your announcement, you know, you get into position, the umpire's already standing on the ball. You know, most of the time, offence and defence are already set. You get yeah. into position after announcing the penalty and we get the game going. Exactly. Uh, the, the worst thing that we can have as an umpire is for the referee to do his announcement and then us to try and find the spot and then try and mark it off. It just delays the game even more. So if we can efficiently march the penalty off while the referee is making his announcement, it keeps the game flowing. One thing I'll also add to that is if you're working with radios and Paul was talking about getting the offended team's captain and giving him his options, it's a good idea just to open your radio so that your wing official can give the same options to the coach because very often what the coach wants is different from what the captain thinks he might want. And you can take it, you can let the coach overrule it very, very quickly without any, any fuss. One of the things I think uh, you probably have stressed well, Greg, is the umpires there in the middle. They're there talking. One of the, one of the ways to keep the lid on an explosive game can be a good umpire in there kind of just, okay, guys, yeah, we've heard this, we've had it now. They, they've got to be good communicators. They've got to be in a position to kind of manage and control the game, not threaten, just cajole the game along, bring the game along with, with the officiating crew, you know, and control that high emotion that's occurring because it's an emotional game. And, you know, just make sure that we get from beginning to end with, Lots of emotion, lots of lots of uh, fervor, but no injuries, minimum penalties, all these other kind of things. And I, th I think a good umpire can be a key to doing that properly. And I don't know about you, Scott, but generally at the start of the season, your voice ends up getting pretty scarce by the end of the, the game. By the time you're talking to all the players and the referees and communicating with your crew, you generally can go a whole game without stopping the talking. Yeah, I do have one question for pretty much everyone, actually. I'm, I'm assuming most people are here because they either umpire or want to be umpires. But how much talking do you guys do pre-game with your centres? Because I and the umpires I've taught down here in Victoria make a habit of introducing ourselves to our centre, finding out his name, finding out where he wants the laces. Because 95% of the time, the centre is going to be kind of offensive line captain. And he's the guy that you're going to deal with most of the time and try and establish like a rapport but before the game with that. Do you guys do that in other states or are we the only ones who do that? We probably don't do it to that extent. But one of the things that we do in um, GNSW is each we do um, each team gets allocated game balls and they have it generally as a designated. It's either the centre or the quarterback brings the ball on 
for when they're on offensive series. And so uh, as a whether I'm an umpire or center judge or referee, I'll tr- ensure that I um, find out their name because it's easier to call out their name for the ball when they're coming in or off or to, to give it when they head off um, as opposed to just going, hey, number X, Y, Z, because a lot of times people don't hear that. Um, so I, I like to use their name for that purpose and it helps um, keep the communication flowing. Um, we don't generally do the pregame to for laces, um, but I can see how that would be a, a benefit to um, a lot of the teams. Yeah, I mean, that's what Dave Sinclair taught me and that's what I've taught our guys, but I don't know how many other... It's not in the mofo, it's not some kind of standard thing, but I I find it's just it helps to establish rapport with the centre. And also, too, it, it, it allows that when you're having communications with the centre in regards to their snapping or moving the ball forward or back or laterally, um, if you've got that rapport already and they know that you're trying to put the ball in the position so they don't have to move it as much. It just helps build that rapport between you and the communication if you need to, you know, correct them during the game. Yeah. And it also gives you somebody to kind of lean on. If one of the other linemen is doing something badly or stupid or something they shouldn't be doing, as a, oi, Mark, have a word to that guy for me. Yeah. And and sometimes that indirect communication helps. Yeah, and if you say it loud enough so the guard can hear you, then you've got two, you know, two birds with one stone. Yeah, exactly. I was going to say with Scott, I think. Okay. Sorry, yeah, go um, ahead. Yeah, sorry, I just wanted to just clarify because that was an interesting thing. I think it was Scott who might have come up with it. Um, I think you were saying that if it goes to – it's a, a back to the penalty just briefly. Um, you mentioned that the coach uh, might have the final say of the captain – um, so I presume you're saying that if the coach elects for something in the penalty decline or accept and it differs to the captain of the team, then you go with the coach's call? Pretty much. I mean, we want the coach to have final say for two reasons. Number one, they're in charge of it. And number two, it makes our life easier, quite frankly. So if my wing is hearing what I'm saying to the captain and then the coach wants to do, I expect the wing and also speaking as a referee, I expect the wing to give me a signal decline or march them back. It takes half a second and it makes it nice and easy. And if there is an issue, if the captain on the field is quite adamant of what they want, I can always turn around and say, you know what? You coach this decline. Are you sure you want to do that? And it just helps because you'll look at the coach saying decline, decline. You'll go, like, okay, I'll shut my mouth then. And that usually kind of diffuses anything that might potentially kick off. It takes the attention, you know, any angst, Daniel, between it makes it between the coach and the captain as opposed to between us and the coach. So it helps the communications between the coach and the officials, keeps everybody on board in that way. And the coach, you know, to an extent will then go off at his, you know, his captain for making the, the wrong decision. But, you know, if we go along with the, you know, the coach's decision, if we go with what captain's on the field, then likely the, the coach will go off at us and then we'll have challenges with him for the rest of the game. If we keep the coach on side, it's easy to then get, you know, um, to keep them online and to keep control of their players throughout the game as well. The yeah, other no, thing no, is no. it makes our wings look really, really good because it doesn't matter if it's their first game or they've been doing this for 30 years. They can hear through the microphone or through their earpiece with the radio what their options are and they can just turn around to the coach and say, do you want second and 10 or first and 20 coach? And it establishes their credibility as well. It makes them look good and makes their life easier. That makes sense. Good. Okay, folks. Any more for any more? Well, first of all, I'd like to thank Greg for his presentation tonight. Thank you. Uh, Well done. Um, It's good good to have... uh, new people getting on, on the line and doing this. We need more people to kind of put the hand up and volunteer. That's not dropping a hint to anybody. And who's oh, I would say, Miles, it does help immensely that you and Paul have done such a great job with the material in the first place. Um, you know, it's all there and we just, you know, just organise it um, in the flow that we want. Good. Glad. I'm glad it's useful. That's the point. <laughs> Well, that's all for this session on being an umpire. I hope you found it interesting. 
The purpose of this session was to look at the umpire position and how to work it when you're asked to do so. A number of good points are raised. I think the key takeaways are, the umpire is at the in the center of the crew and the player revolves around them. They must be very confident in being surrounded by the play. The umpire is the person who most regularly communicates with the referee about the flow of the game, the fouls, the penalties, the team temperament, etc. The umpire often mentors and leads the crew, so the referee can manage the whole of the game. The umpire is a communicator. We can't stress that enough. They can keep the tempo and temperament of the game even and flying when all other things are going wrong. It's a vital role and something every official should try at least once. I would like to thank Greg Evers for giving up his time to prepare and present this session. In two weeks, we will continue our mechanics series. This will be So You Want to Work the Wings, presented by myself, Miles Newman. I will be talking about the two shallow wings, that is the linesman and line judge, and the chain crow as well. Finally, I remind you that AGOA has an online presence on the web at www.ago.org.au. On Facebook, at the Australian Gridiron Officials Association Facebook page, The Neutral Zone. And we have our AGOA Training and Development Group also on Facebook. If you are not a member, speak to your state training managers and join the discussion. Also, we have a YouTube channel, AGOA Videos, which you should already know about if you found this video. These sessions are currently conducted by Zoom every two weeks, and then we create a video of the session and place it on YouTube. If you have any suggestions for further sessions, contact me on Facebook, or my email is miles.newman at ago.org.au. If you enjoyed this session, join us online next time. If you are re-watching the session that you participated in, come back next time and bring a friend. My name is Miles Newman. See you next time. Thanks for watching and stay engaged.